Uh, so from here, without further ado, I am going to kick it over to Dr. Michael Greger. Uh, he is the founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He's written several books that are all uh, bestsellers on the New York Times list, and he is an internationally very, very well-known speaker um, with everything he has done for nutrition. He also runs nutritionfacts.org, nutrition so hop over there later and take a check, take a check at um, all the free resources they have available. It's an absolutely incredible website. So from here, Dr. Greger, I'm going to let you take the screen. At the very end, I will come back for just a little bit of Q&A, but from here, the show is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be kicking off this Food as Medicine conference. Uh, very much looking forward to the discussion, but let me switch over to my slide so nobody gets uh, seasick watching me uh, wobble on my uh, on my treadmill here. Allow me to begin on a personal note. This is a picture of me. Take around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass operations, basically got too scarred up inside, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. There was nothing more they could do. Her life was over at age 65. But then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. And my grandma was one of the death's door people. Frances Greger, my grandmother, arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, engine, claudication. Her condition so bad, she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not only out of her wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. This is my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. When Dr. Ornish published his lifestyle heart trial years later, proven with something called quantitative angiography, then indeed heart disease could be reversed in the majority of patients without drugs, without surgery, just a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, I assume this is gonna be the game changer. I mean, my family had already seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white, published in one of the most prestigious medical journals on the planet, but nothing happened. So wait a second. If effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be? in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a you know corporate budget driving its promotion well i made it my life's mission to find out for those of you unfamiliar with my work every year i read through every issue of every english language nutrition journal in the world so busy folks like you don't have to and then compile all the most interesting the most groundbreaking the most practical findings to create new videos and articles every day from a nonprofit site nutritionfacts.com org um it uh uh everything on the website is free there's there's no ads no corporate sponsorship no kickback strictly non-commercial not selling anything just put it up as a public service as a labor of love as a tribute to my grandmother all proceeds i receive from the sale of my books goes directly to charity all honoraria from speaking engagements like this one goes directly to charity i just want to do for everyone's family what pritikin did for my family. New videos and articles every day and the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. Okay, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa um, uncovered what may be one of the most important advances in health, according to one of our most uh, famous medical figures of the 20th century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that uh, many of our most common and major diseases were universally rare, like heart disease in the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary heart disease was almost non-existent. So wait a second, our number one cause of death almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost entirely from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in kind of modern day plant eaters. 
say, wait a second, maybe the Africans were just dying early from something else, never lived long enough to have a heart attack. No, here's age match heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 autopsies in Missouri, same age and gender distribution, 136 myocardial infarctions. More than 100 times the rate of our number one killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda. Still, just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death, out of 1,427 patients, less than one in eight thousand whereas here it's an epidemic as we know atherosclerosis hardening of the arteries begins in childhood by age 10 the arteries of nearly all kids raised on the same american diet already have fatty streaks in their arteries the first stage out of the disease and then the plaques start forming in our 20s get worse in our 30s and then can start killing us all. In our heart, cause a heart attack, and our brains, the same disease process can cause a stroke. So if there is anyone watching now this morning older than age 10, then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have, whether you know it or not. But is that even possible? You know, and researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that do not get epidemic heart disease. They're hoping they were able to, you know, slow the disease down, maybe even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. The disease started to reverse, to get better. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies want to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. That improvement in blood flow on the left, you see that, to the heart muscle itself, was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes under the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, I mean, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table, right? And get all red hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body work its magic, right? But what if you kept whacking shin the same place every day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It never heal. You go to your doctor, you'd be like, ah, oh, my shin hurts. Doctor be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. Still whacking your shin three times a day, still really hurts like heck, but oh, feel so much better. Those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. Okay. It's like when people are given nitroglycerin for you know crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause of disease. Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-injuring ourselves, stabbing ourselves with a fork three times a day, we may never heal. You know, it's like smoking. You know, one of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if we never started smoking at all. Right? Our body wants to be healthy, right? So every morning of our smoking life, that healing process starts until wham, first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure, is to just stop re-damaging ourselves, right? Get, get out of the way and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health, right? Sure, you can choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer, but why beat yourself up at all? We've known about this for decades. American Heart Journal, 1977. Cases like Mr. F.W. here, 
uh, heart disease so bad, couldn't even make it to the mailbox, started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. All right, there we go. Now, of course, there are these uh, fancy new uh, anti-angina drugs on the market now, cost thousands of dollars a year, but hey, at the highest dose, may be able to prolong exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. It does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon, right? See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper, they can work better. Now, uh, normally at this point, I move on to killer number two, cancer. Talk about the role diet may play in preventing, arresting, or reversing each of our top 15 killers. Uh, but, uh, you know, I want to save a lot of time for questions. And, you know, in a certain sense, like what more do we need to know? Right? There's only one diet ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet, right? So anytime anyone tries to sell you on some new diet they heard about, do me a favor, ask them one simple question. Right? Has it been proven to reverse heart disease you know the most likely reason me and all my loved ones will die if the answer is no why would you even consider it right if that's all a plant-based diet could do reverse the number one killer of men and women shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove another one and the fact they also be so effective preventing arresting and reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming um, and so let me just touch on those uh, two conditions quickly. Type 2 diabetes, um, which we can prevent, arrest, and reverse with a plant-based diet, something we've known since the 1930s. A group of diabetics are placed on a type of plant-based diet. Within five years, a quarter of them were able to get off insulin. But, you know, plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets. I mean, maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out. What you'd have to do is switch people to a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Ah, then we could see if plant-based eating has some unique benefits beyond the, you know, all the easy weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait 44 years, but here it is. Subjects were weighed every day, and they started to lose weight. They're made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food. Some of the participants had problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Ugh. But eventually they adapted so no weight loss despite restricting meat eggs dairy and junk okay so with zero weight loss i mean did the plant-based diet still help well overall insulin requirements were cut about 60 percent and half were able to get off their insulin altogether despite no change in weight oh wow how many years did that take now 16 days 16 days later so we're talking diabetics who've had diabetes as long as 20 years injecting 20 units of insulin a day then as few as 13 days later on none diabetes for 20 years then off all insulin in less than two weeks diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet for decades they were just 13 days away at any time from being free. Here's patient number 15, 32 units of insulin on the control diet. And then 18 days later on none, lower blood sugars on 32 units, less insulin. That's the power of plants. And as a bonus, their cholesterol dropped like a rock to under 150. Again, in about 16 days. You know, just like moderate changes in diet usually only you know will net you modest reductions in cholesterol how moderate do you want your diabetes right everything in moderation may be a truer statement than many people realize our moderate changes in diet can leave diabetics with moderate blindness moderate kidney failure moderate amputation maybe just a few toes or something moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing there was a famous study published in a, uh, a journal called Cell Metabolism that purported to show that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health and smoking, supposedly suggesting that people under 65 ate lots of animal protein four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, 
you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating a lot of animal protein, middle age, didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. The academic institution where the study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette, explaining how, look, eating a diet rich in animal proteins may quadruple one's risk of dying from cancer, comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. So I mean, what was the response in the academic community to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Well, a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me, right? So, so better not tell anyone about the whole meat and cheese thing. Right? That reminds me of a uh, famous uh, Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of uh, lung cancer by 19%? Well, hey, Drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer, or, or doubling one's risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk of heart disease, eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold, eating lots of meat and dairy. So they conclude, let's keep some perspective here. The risk of lung cancer from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other uh, everyday activities. So breathe deep, right? That's like saying, you know, don't worry about getting stabbed. Uh, you know, because you look, getting shot, so much worse, right? Uh, two risks don't make a right, right? Of course, you'll note uh, Philip Morris uh, stopped throwing dairy into the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. <clears throat> Just saying. All right, let's move on here. Uh, high blood pressure, killer number. 13 here. Hold on one second. Uh, we, oh, had a little treadmill mishap. All right, we're back in business. Killer number 13. Uh, so, uh, 78 million Americans affected. That's about one in three adults. And as we age, our pressures get higher and higher. So, I said by age 60, most of us have high blood pressure. Well, it affects most of us when we get older. Maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural, inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Researchers took blood pressure to a thousand people living in rural Kenya, a typical Kenyan diet, one centered around whole plant foods, corn, beans, vegetables, fruit, greens. Our pressures go up as we age, so such that by age 60, most of us are hypertensive whereas their pressures actually go down. And the lower, the better. The 140 over 90 cutoff is arbitrary. Of course, it's been dropped since then. Even people who start out with blood pressures under 120 over 80 appear to benefit from blood pressure reduction. I mean, right? I mean, if we had a pressure 120 over 80, we'd get a gold star from our PCP, but the ideal pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further pressure uh um, actually be 110 over 70. wait a second 110 over 70 is it even possible to get blood pressures down that low it's not just possible it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets and living healthy enough lives over two years of this uh, rural kenyan hospital 1800 patients were admitted Oh, how many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow. Must have had low rates of heart disease, right? No, they had no rates of heart disease, not a single case of atherosclerosis, our number one killer, was found. Rural China, same thing, about 110 over 70 their entire lives, 70-year-olds. Same blood pressure as 16-year-olds, right? Now, Africa, China, vastly different diets, but what they shared in common that they're plant-based day to day with meat only on special occasions uh now i mean why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diets that are so protective because in the western world as the american heart association pointed out the only group of folks getting it down that low on average 
are those eating strictly plant-based diets coming in perfect at about 110 over 65. This is the largest study of those eating plant-based diets to date, 89,000 Californians, comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians, those eating meat more on like a weekly basis than a daily basis, compared to those who eat no meat, uh, compared to those who eat no meat except fish, uh, compared to those who eat no meat at all, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. Now, this was an Adventist study, so even the non-vegetarians didn't eat a lot of meat. I tend to eat lots of fruits and vegetables, exercise, not smoke. So there's a really healthy cohort of meat eaters, but still there appeared to be this stepwise drop in high blood pressure rates as people ate more and more plant-based. Same thing with diabetes, same thing with obesity. So yeah, sure, you can throw the vast majority of your risk out the window eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white, any movement we can make along the spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant health benefits. You can show this experimentally, right? You take vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you can do it the other way, take people who already eat meat, remove meat from their diet, and their blood pressures go down in just seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications. They had to stop their medications. Like, I mean, once you treat the cause, once you eliminate the disease, you can't be on blood pressure pills with normal blood pressure. Right? You drop your pressures too low, get dizzy, fall over, hurt yourself. Right? So, so your doctor has to pull you off the pills. Right? Lower pressures on fewer drugs in seven days. That's the power of plants. So. Does the American Heart Association recommend a no meat diet? No, they recommend this low meat diet, so-called DASH diet. So we say, why not completely plant-based? I mean, when the DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? No, uh, they, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was explicitly designed with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a vegetarian diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population, right? They didn't think the public could handle the truth. Now, I mean, in their defense, you can see what they were thinking, right? Just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, diets never work at all unless you actually eat them so they're like look how many people are going to go you know strictly plant-based right so so i mean if they soft pedal the message come up with some kind of compromised diet well you know you can see how on a population scale you might do more good okay tell that to the thousand american families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure maybe it's time to start telling the american public the truth which is that in the united states of america most deaths are preventable and related to nutrition according to the global burden of disease study the largest most rigorous analysis of risk factors published to date funded by the bill and Melinda gates foundation the number one cause of death in these united states is the american diet uh, they're also a leading cause of disability diet has since bumped tobacco to number two smoking now only kills about a half million americans every year whereas our diet kills many more well wait if most deaths in the united states are preventable and related to nutrition right if diet is number one cause of death well then obviously nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school right I mean, obviously, it's the number one thing your doctor talks to you about at every single visit, right? How, how could there be this disconnect between the science and the mainstream practice of medicine? Well, uh, let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s. Back in the 1950s, the average per capita per capita cigarette consumption was about 4,000 cigarettes a year. I mean, the average person walking around smoked half pack a day on average. 
the media was telling you to smoke famous athletes agreed even santa claus wanted you to smoke i mean look you want to keep fit and stay slender so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim and lots of sugar to stay slim and trim a lot better than that apple there i mean sheesh right though apples do connote goodness and freshness reads one internal tobacco industry memo which brings up many possibilities for making a youth oriented cigarette they want to make apple flavored cigarettes for kids shameless for digestion's sake you should smoke i mean no curative power is claimed by philip morris but better be safe than sorry and smoke blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere no woman ever says no there's no around so firm so fully packed right? after all john wayne smoked them until they got lung cancer and died you know back then even the paleo folks were smoking and yes so were the doctors now this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession yes some doctors smoked camels but others uh, preferred lucky so there was a little disagreement there the leader of the u.s senate agreed i mean who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation not a single case of throat irritation how could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink maybe in <clears throat> flint michigan or <clears throat> But don't worry, you do get a little irritated. Your doctor can always write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is an ad from the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when mainstream medicine is saying that smoking on balance may be good for you, when the American Medical Association is saying that, well, where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun. Then she smoked a camel. Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science. That is when he still could speak before he died of throat cancer. Now, if by some miracle there was some kind of smokingfacts.org website back then that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this, an Adventist study out of California in 1958, showing that non-smokers may have at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first when famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored off the face of the earth. He had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies, on airplanes, right? Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. So, back to our thought experiment. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize that the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit is uh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until you're physician tells you between puffs to quit you could have cancer by then if you wait until the powers that be officially recognized like the surgeon general did in the subsequent decade you'd be dead by then right it took 25 years for the surgeon general's report to come out it took more than seven thousand studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General report against smoking was finally released in the 1960s. You think maybe after the first 6,000 studies, it could give people a little heads up or something? It's a powerful industry. Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 1950s, on one hand, you had all society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, okay, well, we can fast forward 55 years. As you know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about the risk of something else they may be putting in their mouths, 
course, not just one study, you put all the studies together, mortality from all studies, from all causes put together, including many of our dreaded diseases, stroke, cancer, significantly lower among those who are eating more plant-based. So instead of something going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you know going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize that the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habits are eh, probably not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I and mean, if you wait until your physician tells you between bites to change your diet, maybe too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA actually went on record refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Could have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry, maybe. Okay, so we know why the AMA may have been sucking up to the tobacco industry, but why weren't individual doctors speaking out? I mean, there were a few gallant souls ahead of their time speaking up against industries killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary diseases uh, what was the ama's rallying cry back then everything in moderation extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation oh that's fine sound familiar today the food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics misinformation twisting the science the same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risk of cigarette smoke and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the national confectioners association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat whereas consumption of animal products and processed foods cause at least 14 million deaths around the world every year so for those of us in this involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution we're talking about 14 million lives in the balance every year these days plant-based diets may be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of quitting smoking but how many more people have to die uh, before the cdc encourages people not to wait for open heart surgery uh, to start eating healthy as well until the system changes we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health, for our patient's health. We can't wait uh, until society catches up to the science again, because it's a matter of life and death. You know, Dr. Williams became uh, president of the uh, American College of um, uh, Cardiology a few years ago. In an interview, he was asked why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients. Uh, strictly strictly a plant-based diet um uh, i don't mind dying dr williams replied i just don't want it to be my own fault thank you so much everyone very much looking forward to your questions Uh, it's a very interesting place to end. I've actually reached out to Dr. Kim Williams to speak for us later this year. Oh, Another fantastic. You are in for a treat. I know. Another amazing quote of his is he says something to the effect of, I'm not going to stop until the number one cause of death for cardiologists is no longer cardiovascular disease. Oh, He's there just, we go. Yeah. That's the way to do so, it. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in here about additional resources for recipes, and I think this would be a great time just to talk about your website. Um, oh. There are kits that are free to download, healthy eating guides that are evidence-based. Maybe could you tell us a little bit more about that one? Because I know a lot of a lot of the people in here with us are looking for more resources, and your website has a ton that are free and downloadable. Where should they go? Oh, fantastic! Yes, nutritionfacts.org, free nonprofit, science-based public service, daily updates on the latest nutrition uh research via bite-sized videos more than a thousand videos on nearly every aspect of healthy eating new videos and articles every day and latest in evidence-based nutrition uh, we do have uh you know uh eating guides that you can you know have in the you know out in the waiting room 
Um, you know, another great resource, there's an organization called Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in DC. They run this uh, Kickstart program. So you can go to 21daykickstart.org. This is something you can mention to a patient in a two minute, two minute visit um, to get them started on the right track. It's a free program, starts yeah. at the first of every month. Um, uh, th hundreds of thousands of people have done it. It's in a bunch of different languages. Basically, you just join it's kind of a, as a social media group and you get daily tips and advice and you can get, answer questions and, and basically just kind of hold your hand through a, through a three week process in the hopes that by the end of really going all in for three weeks, all of a sudden people are feeling better, they have more energy. Um, uh, you know, the better digestion, less painful yeah. periods, whatever it is, such that they have the internal motivation to continue going. It's no longer just a doctor wagging a finger in their face. Their own body is telling them how good they feel. Of course, we can take labs before and after and show the dramatic results. Um, and so uh, that's another great resource I encourage people to, uh, to, to go to, to refer your patients to. Absolutely. And then, do I remember correctly, you have an app called The Daily Dozen? Oh, yeah. It's a free app, iPhone, Android, called The Daily, uh, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. So, uh, the How Not to Die, the book, um, uh, is the first half of the book is just 15 chapters, and each of the 15 leading causes of death, talking about the old diet, may play in preventing, arresting, reversing each of the top 15 killers. I was just able to touch on a few today. Yeah. I didn't want it to just be a reference book. So, the second half of the book, so it's kind of a more practical day-to-day -day grocery store kind of practical guide centering my recommendations around a daily dozen checklist um, of uh, the healthiest of healthy foods i encourage people to fit into their daily routine so greens every day the healthiest vegetable berries every day the healthiest fruits uh you know uh a tablespoon of ground flaxseed a quarter teaspoon of turmeric the best beverages the best sweeteners how much exercise to get every day basically just trying to inspire people to uh do some of these healthiest of healthy things um and so yeah and so you can you know check your progress and track it over yeah. you know just as a kind of a fun way uh so yeah that's another uh resource awesome uh question from me so i read your book and you uh, poke fun at the educational training quite a bit we've learned plants are really powerful um, yet it's not really a focus of most education for clinical professionals in various fields today. Uh, what's being done to change that? It has, yeah. has any progress been made since your book was released? Yeah, that's a fantastic point, right? I mean, doctors have a severe nutrition deficiency in education, right? Most doctors just never talk about the impact healthy nutrition can have on the course of illness. So, right, we graduate without this powerful tool in our medical toolbox, right? um of course there's you know also you know institutional barriers time constraints lack of reimbursement you know in yeah. general we're just simply not you know paid for counseling people on how to take better care of themselves of course you know drug companies also play a role in influencing medical education and practice you know you can you know uh when's the last time you got taken out to dinner by big broccoli you know I and mean, that's uh um, that, that'll give you a sense of the, of the, the priorities of our system. Unfortunately, there mu hasn't much changed. Only a quarter of medical schools in the country have a single dedicated course on nutrition. So, uh, so we have a long way to go, particularly because it's the leading cause of death. And it's a modifiable risk factor, something we can do about it. Right. Um, uh, give us a sneak peek. What's the best recipe in your How Not to Die cookbook? oh my god um you know it's it's really uh, you know uh whatever whatever you're wh whatever you're into but uh oh i'm well right now it's soup weather i don't know i don't yeah. know how the weather is where you are today six but six inches of snow this morning on our yeah, drive well, yeah. i'm in the arctic tundra <laughs> uh so yeah i we have this beautiful winter wonderland uh everything's covered in ice outside so for me it's soup weather yeah. Um, so we're talking, so we have a lot of wonderful kind of beans and greens, uh, hearty soups. Um, so actually that's what I, that's my, that's my lunch plans today. Um, is gonna, is gonna warm myself up a little bit with some soup. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, one of the questions I've gotten, I know a lot of people have, um, there's this kind of fear of all or nothing. So people end up being afraid to ever take the first step. Um, what are some phrases you use with your patients who are coming in with the standard American diet to help them work toward being more plant-based? What, what are the phrases that really resonate? That's a great question, right? So yeah, we can never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so it's really, first of all, figuring out where the patients are. And so, you know, some, pe some people, particularly after a diagnosis, 
um, you know, new diagnosis, whether it's prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, you know, where, you know, we start discussing, uh, you know, uh, some of the, some of the, our various options. That's, you know, when I may bring up something like 21 day kickstart program. It's like, let's give it a try free sample. Right. I mean, people can't wrap their minds out of, wait a second, I'm not going to eat a pepperoni pizza ever. Like, no, 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 no. Just three weeks, just for the next three weeks. Let's just try it, try it out see what happens. Kind of as a little experiment. Um, um, and then you can, you know, do labs before and after, really show people uh, the impact their own body can tell them how they feel. And so just diving, uh, you know, going all in um, mm -hmm. to give them that kind of data point, to give them that information. Actually, it wasn't as hard as I thought. I actually found some really, yeah. you know, yummy things and it's less expensive. And, you know, it gives them some, some more data. Now, but other uh, patients who are more uh, reticent is what I'll start is I'll start adding healthy foods to the diet. So I'm like, okay, I want you to eat a, you know, an apple before every meal, right? Mm -hmm. And so here they are just think I'm gonna be taking away all their favorite foods. I'm like, no, 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 not, let's not take away anything. Let's just add some healthy foods. And what happens is it crowds out um, yeah. some of the less healthy options. And, you know, every time I see them, you know, we can start adding, tweaking more and more. And so it's, you know, very kind of easy going. And eventually, I mean, it doesn't take much, you know, I mean, so just adding, you know, like three of the healthiest foods, greens, um, uh, beans and berries. So the legumes, like, you know, beans, chickpeas, chickpeas, lentils, like just adding those three healthy, healthy foods um, to the daily diet and just removing from their daily diet, um, you know, anything with trans fats, which has already basically been done for us, at least here in the States. Yep. Um, uh, and number two, um, uh, processed meat, right? So bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch, meat, sausage, uh, known human carcinogens, um, increasing our risk of colorectal cancer. So um, uh, removing those. And then third, you know, liquid candy, soda. Um, if you just did, you know, remove those few things, added those few things, I mean, you'd really go a long way yeah. towards getting the benefits of, of uh, you know, more complete diet makeover. Yeah. Another thing, I'm a relatively recent mom. I, my boys are three and one. And Aww. so the three-year-old is amazing. He's better than most adults, you know. The one-year-old is making up for that. And uh. I heard a story on the radio the other day. I won't be able to cite it, but it said something to the effect of 50% of the vegetable intake for kids in America is French fries. Oh. Um, where are we headed when that is the status of our nutrition for children? Yeah, I know. Tragic. Unfortunately, it's not much better for adults. Yeah. So actually, most calories in the American diet, more than 50% come from these so-called ultra processed foods, which really mm -hmm. aren't foods at all, right? They're just these kind of industrial formulations of foods that you wouldn't, you know, ingredients you wouldn't actually find in a kitchen even um, to kind of mimic the taste, you know, hyper sweet, hyper salty, hyper fatty foods to kind of dig into our natural biological drives um and uh, and you know such that we can't eat just one um and what we're seeing with the childhood obesity epidemic and then following a, a diabetes epidemic is we are facing the first generation of children um uh, estimated predicted to live shorter lives than their parents that's never happened before we've had this inexorable progress towards improving life expectancy in this country. And for the first time, we're slipping backwards. And um, that's yeah. in large part to the uh, obesity epidemic, which really um, all comes down to diet. It's not a matter yeah. of kind of, uh, you know, you can't outrun a bad diet, right? I mean, we have this yeah. sense that, um, you know, it's, well, it's calories in, calories out. And so it's kind of equally important exercise versus um uh versus you know what we eat but that's not true at all because um we have you know much more control over the calories inside of the equation most of the calories out um is just metabolism even if you're exercising multiple times a week uh the vast majority is just the the normal metabolism that's kind of keep us alive and the number of um like a you know moderately obese person uh doing moderately intense physical activity like biking, very brisk walking, and burn off about you know, 350 calories an hour or something. But most drinks, snacks, and processed junk are consumed at a rate of about 70 calories a minute, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes five minutes of snacking to wipe out a whole hour of exercise, just giving you a sense of how, you know, how skewed um, it all is. 
So it really comes down to controlling one's environment, surrounding yourselves by surrounding yourself by healthy food. If you're able to fully control your environment and get junk out of the house, yeah. I mean, if the you know if the you know if the, the most calorie dense food in your in your house is an apple, you know you get hungry enough you're gonna eat that apple, right? But if you have apple and you have cookies. You know, in the first day or two, you're going to eat the apple, but eventually, right? You got to, you, so you just get, can't have it in the house. Um, and so just these small little barriers that we can have to take advantage of our kind of our energy conservation drive um, uh, to just surround ourselves by healthy foods. And then it's yeah. like, oh, I'm hungry. I want something sweet. All I got is a sweet potato. All right, throw it in the microwave. A couple minutes later, I mean, a sweet potato, a little, a little cinnamon or something. Um, and look, you know, that's it's just kind of kind of healthy by default. Yeah, absolutely. From here, I'm going to flip over to see what kind of questions we've got coming in. I do know a lot of people have questions about um, how much does organic matter? So grocery stores all have it, um, but with income in, uh, constraints for some uh, patients or also just inability to grow, as you heard, I'm here in Wisconsin, I do garden, but right now there's six inches of snow outside, so it's a long time for me until my garden will be up and running. Wow, well, that, that is indeed the case. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can grow a few herbs on your windowsill, but it quite, you ain't gonna, you, you ain't gonna produce enough calories for anybody, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so yeah, there. So in How Not to Die, I talk about this modeling study that suggests um, that if uh, even half of Americans ate a single more serving of fruits or vegetables every day, we would prevent twenty thousand cases of cancer every year. That's how powerful fruits and vegetables are. But because they were talking about conventional fruits and vegetables, pesticide laden fruits and vegetables, they estimated that the additional pesticide burden on the US population would cause 10 extra cases of cancer. So overall, we would just prevent 19,990 cases of cancer if we ate just a little more fruits and vegetables. That gives you a sense of the tremendous benefit versus the tiny bump in risk. Yeah. And I say, wait a second, why accept any risk at all? Have all benefit, no risk by choosing organic, great. But we should never let concern over pesticides prevent us from stuffing our face with as many fruits and vegetables as possible. Love it. From here, we've got uh, conflicting opinions on seed oils versus olive coconut oil. What's inflammatory in those? Which ones are people supposed to be recommending? Oh, well, so, I mean, ideally, we would get all of our macronutrients from whole foods, right? And so instead of taking protein powders, right, whole foods, instead of um, oil, um, we would be getting, you know, our fat from whole food sources, like nuts, seeds, avocados, um, and carbohydrates, um, instead of, you know, getting it from, you know, uh, from table sugar or corn syrup, right? We'd get it from, you know, sweet potatoes and beets and fruit. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's really the, that's really the goal. So there's really no reason um, that we need to use oil. Oil is actually the most calorie concentrated food available to yeah. us. Um, uh, so it's about 120 calories per tablespoon. So a little drizzle, all of a sudden you added tons of calories. Um, I mean, even butter has fewer calories because it has a little water in it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, 100 cal. I mean, that's like the amount of, uh, uh, you know, calories you might see in a couple of cups of blackberries, for example. You had a couple of cups of blackberries for 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 dessert. Ah, wow, that would that would fill you up, right? But uh, the little drizzle of oil, you wouldn't even feel it in your stomach, right? You'd just be a little glistening on the pasta or something. Um, yet same amount of calories, and so um, they're kind of empty calories. It's kind of like the the oils, like the sugar of the carbohydrate kingdom. Is is the oil is the is the you know empty calories of the fat kingdom whereas god if you got that same amount of oil instead of in walnut oil from actual walnuts oh you get the plant protein and, the, and yeah. the fiber and all the um the minerals and all the other stuff that would be missing from the oil so i encourage people to try to eat whole foods as possible they say wait a second how am i gonna saute yeah. um well you it's amazing you can actually saute in water or broth or wine or um uh, any other kind of liquid just keep things from from sticking and remarkably you really won't kind of tell the difference and for those of you saying well wait a second what about my deep fryer well there's air frying technology now mm -hmm. um you can you know make some sweet potato fries um put them in some salt free ketchup and you're good to go what oh this is a good one we have 
So plant-based, we're going to call it a trendy phrase, although we all here agree plants are super powerful, but there's now plant-based alternatives to pasta and to meats. And these are really just processed foods that are repackaged to make it sound like they're healthy on the outside. What are we learning now about these uh, up and coming kind of plant-based alternatives, especially for like meats, where it's the plant-based burger patty or the plant-based broth? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I have a bunch of videos where I actually compare the nutritional value of something like the, you know, Beyond Burger or the Impossible Burger um, versus kind of a regular beef burger versus something more kind of whole food plant-based like a, like a black bean burger or something. And actually go through and look at the fiber content and the sodium content, the saturated fat content. Definitely better. Step in the right direction, right? So, you know, again, for these people that, that you know, just can't go all you know, uh, you know, kale and quinoa tomorrow, like this is not going to happen. You're like, all right, well, let's start, you know, the next barbecue, let's just substitute this for that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people can't even tell the difference. It's the same kind of mouthfeels and textures that they grew up with. You know, not everyone can make that make that shift as abruptly. And so definitely kind of these are I view these as stepping stone foods, right? So all of a sudden, we're talking zero cholesterol, usually significantly less saturated fat, tends to have the same or even more sodium, um, uh, but actually has low fiber. So definitely better. I just don't want people to stall there. I yeah. want people to continue to improve their diet, move towards those whole foods. But I do see that as a positive step on the way there. And so there actually have been studies. So in Stanford, um, uh, Gardner did, Chris Gardner did a study where he randomized people to kind of beyond meat products like you know plant-based chicken plant-based sausage plant-based burgers versus the regular thing um and a crossover study and found you know significant improvements ldl cholesterol significant yeah. improvements in in tmao um uh, which is a toxic byproduct of the the carnitine and meat um and uh, but didn't see any difference in blood pressure well no no duh because they, they had the same they didn't drop their sodium intake yeah. um uh, but uh, so didn't get the full benefits of plant-based eating but certainly saw some benefits um and so uh um so i'm a big fan of these products but just as a as a transitional food towards even eating healthier later on down the road all right so i'm really looking at a ton of questions um want to hear more about the research for pescatarian diet oh yeah no absolutely um, uh, so the research is um, excellent for pescatarians, um, uh, and uh, part of the reason is that pescatarians tend to be doing it for health, right? The, the, why would someone cut out meat but not fish? They tend to do it for the health, whereas a lot of people, um, particularly young people who are eating more plant-based, they're doing it for these kind of, for non-health reasons. They're doing it for like environment or greenhouse gases or animal welfare or something. Um, and so, you know, in some respects, their um, data in these epidemiological studies isn't as good because, you know, they're just eating French fries and beer, you know, plant based, but not particularly healthy. Whereas the pescatarians are doing it with this healthier mindset and tend to eat more vegetables and, and higher proxies of plant based eating, like higher vitamin C intake, higher fiber intake. These are two com components of plant foods in general. Um, and so, uh, so, so we definitely see some benefits, um, as we saw in that, uh, um, uh, the Adventist two study, um, those cutting out all meat, including fish tended to do better, uh, than those, um, maintaining fish in their diet, but those just eating fish did significantly better, even than the semi vegetarians who were only eating meat once a week, um, at most once a week. Um, and so uh, definitely, uh, again, step in the right direction um, would be a tremendous uh, uh, advantage over standard American diet. But, you know, we all can, you know, you know, improve our diets, you know, diets, it's like, a, it's like a zero sum game, like every time we put something in our mouth, it's a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in our mouth, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, putting banana or oatmeal great putting blueberries in our oatmeal even better right it's like wait a second i mean we can always kind of up our game yeah. and so would encourage people to continue down that path love it uh we've got a very specific one here and um, people want to know more about the impacts of a plant-based diet on parkinson's oh yeah no a that's a fantastic that. question 
Um, and so the number one dietary risk factor for Parkinson's is dairy consumption. Um, there's a recent meta-analysis finding significantly higher um, risk. We're not sure exactly why, whether it's the galactose, um, whether it's the um, uh, uh, changes in uric acid, whether it's so like the pesticide and some of these uh, toxic industrial pollutants that build up in the dairy supply, but whatever it is, um, in terms of preventing Parkinson's, um, that's the most powerful thing we can do in terms of our diet. But what if we are, already have Parkinson's? What can we do um, to treat it symptomatically? And um, I have a series of uh, videos uh, coming out on nutrition facts that are talking about interventions involving legumes. So for example, faba beans actually have um, uh, the equivalent of levodopa in them. Yeah. They, they have the, 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 both the carboxylase inhibitor plus um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the precursor. So you actually get improvement in symptoms eating baba beans. In fact, um, and, uh, and something else important in terms of dietary treatment of Parkinson's is, um, uh, is, uh, uh, uh late day protein restriction. So we eat our protein, um, for breakfast and lunch and not for dinner. Um, because, some uh, uh, no, sorry, opposite. It's called protein redistributed diet. We want protein for supper, not for breakfast, lunch. Why? Because the large neutral amino acids um, uh, found in high protein foods blocks, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the tryptophan across the, um, the, the blood brain barrier. And so um, actually interferes. And so we get an increase in symptoms, but it doesn't matter if you're sleeping when that happens. So um, we want to push our protein rich foods to the evening, helping with symptoms. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, uh, yeah, that would be the main thing. Protein re redistribution, uh, plant-based foods and, 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 and legumes as, uh, as primary protein sources, particularly and get to know faba beans, which was a yeah. uh, surprise to me. So this one, I think we partially answered earlier, but a few people have questions specifically about organic meat or dairy and how that would impact health versus just eating plant-based foods. And I think you said earlier, basically, every shift towards more plants is a good shift, but. Yeah, we should. So, uh, you know, the, the lower we can eat on the food chain, the better. Um, and so organic, um, animal ag is one step up, um, uh, you know, so they're kind of natural herbivores, but that's better than conventional meat because, uh, what, you know, what we learned from the whole mad cow crisis, if you remember back with bovine spongiform encephalopathy, we learned that, oh, why did Oprah say she'd never eat another burger again? Because she learned that we were, you, you know, taking the slaughterhouse byproducts and feeding them back to farm animals, which we continue to this day. Right. Um, and so it turns out that our net, we've turned kind of natural herbivores into carnivores and cannibals. And so they're actually higher up on the food chain. They're like, the, all of a sudden they're like the eagles and the polar bears. And, you know, they build up the PCBs and DDT and um, some of these toxic pollutants that were banned uh, decades ago in some cases, but still found throughout the food supply and will for many centuries. Um, and so eating lower on the food chain is better. So uh, organic would be better than conventional, but to eating the plants directly um, would uh, be, uh, it would lower our exposure the most to these uh, industrial pollutants. Absolutely. Got about two minutes left. So strat, well, this one, I think people want to hear a little bit more strategies for motivating patients to eat plant-based diet. Uh, simply giving patients information doesn't always lead to behavior change. So we mentioned earlier the I think you said the 21 day kickoff was the the free resource that is kind of one of your go tos. Yeah, so other you know I encourage people to uh, I mean it's such a short clinical encounter unfortunately yeah. uh, usually that you want to kind of leave them with materials to kind of mull over and so there's some great documentaries out now uh, one of my favorites is called the game changers um, which yeah. I was honored to be kind of scientific advisor for. Um, uh, and I mean, it's, you know, it was, uh, uh, produced by the, the Titanic guy. What's his name? He's now he has the new avatar movie, whatever. I'm terrible um, with movie people. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, so, but it's like really, you know, it's a high end, you know, a full length documented and just beautifully done and very inspirational and something like that. I'd recommend, and you know, yeah. it's on all the streaming services. 
Um, and so they can watch that and then, you know, just kind of mull over some of these things. You know, you can, there's some books and websites, of course, you can uh, push people to. But I, the, you know, uh, particularly for, you know, younger individuals who have the time and not battling currently chronic disease, where you feel like you have some time to move them. And it's not as much of a kind of a, an urgency over, you know, uh, getting the crap out of the diet. Yeah. All right. And then last one. Our biggest complaint about plant-based diet is how time-consuming it is to eat three meals a day of wholly plant-based. How do we fix the time commitment, Doc? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of batch cooking. Yeah. You know, so Sunday, making a big batch of, you know, everything you need. So, you know, if you're building your meals from, you know, whole grain, whole intact grains and legumes and stuff, you can just make a big batch, you know, how, how many meals do I have this week? What do I got to pack for everybody? um and you know and making big batches you know I, i'm a big fan of these uh, electric pressure cookers like yeah. instant pots um and you know i mean you just put it on press a button forget about it turns itself off um and then you can apportion it um and then you know and then it's uh, i mean it becomes really a, a quick matter once you have all the kind of basic ingredients um uh, sitting there and then you know, having, uh, you know, if you look at my freezer, it's half frozen berries, half frozen greens, you know, fro I, mean, I encourage people to eat green leafy vegetables a day, but you know, they go bad, they only last mm -hmm. a few days, but in the freezer, they're pre chopped pre washed, um, often less expensive, yeah. and actually can be fresher because they're frozen the day of picking, whereas, you know, the collard greens have been sitting on the shelf for, a, you know, a ship for a, for a week or something. Yep. Um, and so it's really kind of a win, win, win all around. Um, and, you know, quickly kind of, you know, microwaved in kind of any dish. Um, and, you know, canned beans, super convenient, uh, yeah. you know, no salt added canned beans. You know, these are kind of the things that, um, you know, that uh, make life a lot easier for those of us who are so busy. Yes, they do. Well, we are going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time joining us today. Your session was amazing. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Oh, I had a fantastic time. Good luck with the weather out there. Thank you.